This episode is intended as reference material for dune, slope or ridge soaring with any type of aircraft. I recently learned 3D modeling and animation in Blender to be able to put on the screen for you guys what lives in my head. With this episode, I'm going to help you visualize in three dimensions what the lifting area in front of a dune, a ridge or a slope looks like and how to make better use of it. Now while I use a paragliding character in these animations, it could just as easily be you underneath your hang glider, in your sailplane or maybe even flying your PPG. For what level of pilots is this video? I think that mainly depends on your style of learning. I encountered pilots that have been flying the dunes for years, yet still took a lot away from discussing the visualization of the lifting area in front of the dune, so they could make still better use of it. And maybe that is because those pilots had a more practical approach to learning stuff. And I also encountered beginners with a more theoretical learning style that could draw out the entire shape, in two dimensions of course, of the lifting area before they even made their first flight. So the only category of pilots for which I think this episode will not be interesting are the pilots that have a really theoretical way of learning and are already very experienced in dune soaring. I tried to make this episode in such a way that it's easy to follow along and understand for people that have only a very basic knowledge of dune soaring, but also make it interesting for pilots that have way more experience. Coach, my name is Bas van Duin and it is my mission to help you get more out of life and your flying career to have less stress and more skills. And today we're going to put more emphasis on the skill part. Specifically the skill of understanding something that we normally cannot see. Being the lifting area in front of a dune. And in this episode you'll hear me use different words for the same thing. Slope, ridge, dune. For me, in the context of this episode, they're all interchangeable. I recently started my 26th year of dune soaring. Originally, I flew the dunes with the hang glider and I've been doing it for about 15 years now with a paraglider. I consider myself to be a very experienced beginner and I think I'm a world-class pro when it comes down to making questionable decisions. I love to share those decisions with you and I hope we can learn together. A bit of context before we go more into the details. When I learned about the basics of dune soaring 30 years ago, the study material was not much different than what we are offered nowadays. The resolution of the images has increased a bit. There are more colors now generally, but in the basics, it still comes down to the same thing. Arrows pointing at stuff, trying to signify things. Luckily nowadays, we also have access to more visual material. Uh, there are a lot of good videos around. There are even a lot of proper free videos around on YouTube. Like this one. But what you see in the vast majority of these videos is that people still use a two-dimensional overlay, usually over nice camera footage. And I think the big downside of that from a learning perspective for you as a viewer is that it is very open to interpretation. So I thought it nice to make some 3D visualizations to hopefully get some more knowledge in the brain of yours. Please drop me a line in the comments to let me know how this works for you. So to be formal, we're talking about orographic lift soaring. Now that's quite a formal meteorological term that I think a nobody uses. It's even possible that your instructor doesn't know that term. So from now on, I won't use this horrible formal term. I'll just use the term dune soaring, ridge soaring or slope soaring. By the way, this concept of ridge soaring is not new at all. It's nearly 100 years old. The first ridge soaring flight, according to a bit of Googling, was made in 1922 by a guy called Arthur Martens in a sailplane with a flight of over one hour. Now I put some very relevant disclaimers, nuances, uh, and further explanations further at the end of this video because I thought it would be a bit dry to start off with that. So we're gonna dive straight into the contents now uh, and I'm sure if you find that interesting, you'll stick around to check out the last part of the video as well because I think it will provide some extra value for you. Meet Red. 
He wants to be an awesome rich flying pilot. He even has the gear, he even has the looks. He even got those nice wide frame sunglasses. But there is a slight problem. He keeps ending up on the beach instead of sky high. Here we can see him launching, gaining height, making some turns. Eventually losing height and landing again. I'll play the clip again, take a close look. We're gonna do a little quiz and I'll give you some time to think about the answer. So what do you think is causing him to end up on the beach? Answer A. His turns are too wide. Answer B. He picks the wrong line to fly. Answer C. The wind is not strong enough. So first the wrong answers. Answer A, his turns are too wide is wrong. Because if he were to make his turns too wide, that would be less efficient, but he would still be able to fly back into the lifting area and remain at the same altitude or gain altitude even. Answer C, because the wind is not strong enough, is also wrong because we can clearly see him go up a few times. But to see why answer B, he picks the wrong line, is actually correct, we need to be able to see the area of lift. So let's do that. So this is a 3D approximation of what the lifting area would look like in front of this dune in these conditions. Now the center has the strongest lift. And at the outer boundaries, the air rises at roughly the same speed at which your glider is descending relative to the air. Compare it to a conveyor belt. If I'm standing on a conveyor belt talking to you, and that conveyor belt is moving 10 kilometers per hour that way, then I have to walk 10 kilometers per hour that way to stay on the same line as you. It's a bit of a weird way to have a conversation, but I think you understand the example. When the air is rising at the same speed as you're descending relative to that air, you're staying at the same height relative to the ground. And that's what happened, and that is what is happening when you're at the outer side of this lifting area. So let's look again at the same scene, now from a bit of a different angle and with that lifting area visible. So initially he does great because we can see him going up. But he starts moving towards the sea too soon. He's not flying on an ideal line. He's not flying at the center, but he's actually passing the center and flying to the seaward side. And after his second turn, he leaves the lifting area altogether. Now this is something when you're flying yourself, you can clearly feel and see. When you're losing the lift, you can feel that you start descending. Sometimes it's very subtle, but you can also always see it, especially in these conditions with a relatively small slope you can just in this case look to your right and see that you're descending below the top of the dune meaning you're going towards the ground so if you catch this quick enough you can just let yourself drift back into the lifting area to gain altitude again if you do this too late for instance after the last turn you're too high to get safely back into the lifting area so then it's better to walk back to the dune and launch again so now we see Red again. He is back at it. He decided to stick to the dune like glue after getting our feedback. He's doing much, much better. He's not bombing out anymore. He's actually soaring. He's doing a great job. But he's not there yet, since here is Blue. They call him Big Blue because he's a tad heavier, yet he is flying the exact same type and size of glider but he's still constantly higher than red. He launched in the same spot and he's flying the same dune, WTF. He is lighter than blue, yet he is flying the same wing as blue. So he remembers his theory correctly and thinks, this is not possible. I should have a more favorable minimum sink speed. I should be descending slower to the same air as B is. So I should be higher. So another quiz question. Why do you think blue is higher than red? Answer A. It's completely random who is higher at what time. Answer B. 
Blue must have launched earlier and therefore has had more time to gain height. Answer C. Red picked a suboptimal line to fly. Let's go over the wrong ones again first. Answer A. It is completely random who is higher at what point in time is false. Because remember, this is an approximation. This is a model and in this model we control all the circumstances. There is no coincidence. There has not been any extra lift for blue. There have been no secret disadvantages for red. So no, what you see is what you get. Of course there is some variation in who is higher at what point, but that variation does not explain this difference. Compare it to what you experience at your local slope. It are always the same guys that fly the highest, right? Answer B is also wrong. Blue must have launched earlier. Because you see, red is not gaining any height. He could be flying around there indefinitely, and we can do this in a simulation, punish him, let him fly forever, but he will never get higher than where he is at now if he doesn't change something. Because the correct answer is answer C. He picked a suboptimal line. So let's look again why answer C is correct. We can clearly see from this perspective that he is flying at the edge of the lifting area. This time at the other side of the lifting area near the dune. His wing is often even sticking outside of the lifting area. And he even gets clear clues. Because when he is turning, he goes up instead of down. This is quite counterintuitive, isn't it? That is because when he makes his turns, he actually flies through the center of the lifting area, but then leaves it again to hug the dune. He keeps drifting back to the rear of the lifting zone. So the visual and sensory clue actually is the same as in the first example. You can feel what is happening and you can also see it. And in this case, you have an extra visual clue, namely the other pilots that you can compare yourself to. Act on that information. So time to discuss some further nuances and a bit of disclaimer to help you get the most out of this episode. The shape of this lifting area is merely an approximation and the actual size and shape may differ according to a lot of factors. The wind direction, the wind speed, the gustiness, the shape of the hill, the uh, actual slope, the incline, the uh, roughness of the terrain, certain obstacles uh, that, are maybe in, that are maybe disrupting the laminar flow. So, it's certainly not a given that all lifting areas for this specific dune will look the same in all cases. This episode and the following episodes, because I plan to make a series, are merely intended to give you some visual building blocks in your brain to help construct an image of what you may encounter in your practical flying situation. Always keep using your head. What I'm showing you in this episode and future episodes on this topic does not replace adequate schooling. It is merely intended as being complementary. Proper dune soaring is a flying style in itself with its own challenges, dangers and joys that you should not take lightly. Instructors, please feel free to use this video or parts of this video as instruction material for your students. All that I ask in return is that you point them towards Flight Coach on YouTube. What I'm showing you in this episode and the whole series does not scale to mountain size. So what I mean by that is if you would make this say 100 or 500 times bigger, it is not said that the lifting zone will also be that much bigger. In the mountains, flying is a completely different sport. What you're seeing here does not take into account thermals that may or may not exist. In these examples, unless specifically pointed out otherwise, there are no thermals present. As you can see, the speed of the gliders and the turn coordination and probably a lot of other details are not correct. And for my teaching purposes, they don't have to be correct. Yes, I know that paragliders swing out when they make a turn. I did not take the time to model that because I think it does not add anything to the value of this series. This is an approximation of the lifting area. 
In my experience, it looks somewhat like an inverted pear, which I exaggerated a bit for teaching purposes. The actual shape, as said, will differ on a lot of circumstances. And maybe you're convinced that it does not look like a pear, but like a banana or an orange or a watermelon. Please share your experiences in the comments down below. And it's important to realize that this lifting area has its effect on your wing, not so much on your body. So it's important to realize where is my wing in relation to where the lifting area is. And that may be a couple of meters above your head. Of course, it's important to realize where your body is because you want to prevent slamming into things like I did 10 years ago. Check it out. So yeah, body position is important to realize, but to prevent hitting stuff or hitting other people. Wing positioning is important for going up, staying at the same altitude or descending. The beauty of 3D modeling. I can make all kinds of shapes to teach you all kinds of things. This is me working. Slopes with gaps, slopes with bumps. Slopes with small slopes in front of them, slopes with obstacles in front of them where we can maybe fly behind. Yeah, my mind is really revving up about all this. I think we're gonna make some nice episodes. So next time, let's look at the influence on the dune shape on the size of the lifting area. What would happen to the width of the lifting area? And the height? And the intensity, position? If you appreciate this episode, consider pressing that like button, maybe subscribe if you have not already, and other ways to support the channel, tell your flying buddies to come check me out, or maybe buy some stuff via the sponsored links down below. See you next time, see you in the air. <laughs>